William Hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forever. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading comes from Exodus 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. <clears throat> whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep me, keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work you your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the uh, aligned resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made, made, between, made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Uh, honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not commit your neighbor's house, you shall not co com convict 
your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The holy holy wisdom, holy word. teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The, judgment, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the home. By them also is your servant enlightened, and is keep in and in keeping them there in great reward. Who can check one's own offenses? What is many of my secret thoughts? All above, keep your ser servant from presum presumptuous sins. Let them not be not get the this the what dominion. dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and said and and in innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. First Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will de destroy the wisdom of the wise, and 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 the discernment of the discerning I will draw. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where it, it where it is the debate of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom, wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, our the world did not know God thought, thought wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified and a stumbling block of jewels and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and wisdom of God for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom of God and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Amen. Holy wisdom, holy holy wisdom, holy word. Please rise as you are able as we prepare to receive the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, and both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples rem remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Today's lessons are a little confusing. They don't quite seem to go together somehow. But I think they're all about where do we find wisdom? Where do we find the wisdom of God? And we know that the Jewish people understood that wisdom resided in the law and the law was kept in God's house and everything in the temple that happened there. And they were the stewards of the wisdom. But today's lesson challenges that. 
Sometimes people look at this story and they use it as an example about how even Jesus got angry, that even Jesus got fed up. And so anger in a righteous cause is okay. But I don't think that's the main lesson that we're supposed to get from this. But it helps us understand. And maybe it helps us feel a little more the humanity of Jesus. Because, I mean, after all, haven't you ever had a time when you had just had enough? And I'm over it. That's it. I'm done. One of those times when you just stood there and you gritted your teeth and you held your breath and you did like your mama taught you and counted to 10. Or maybe you had to count to 50. And maybe you turned away and walked away. Maybe you've done it many times because you just don't like what you see going on. But you aren't sure you should speak up or stand up or interfere. But then finally there comes that point and you just can't turn away one more time. You just can't grit your teeth hard enough. And you've had enough and you decide you can't be silent. And so you speak out. And maybe you just do something kind of fairly dramatic. I don't know what that might be in your case. But looking back on it, you think, well, maybe that wasn't the best way to handle things. May not have been all that smart. But we all reach that tipping point, that breaking point where enough is enough. Have you ever had a time like that? <laughs> I'm a mother of five children. I've had times like that. Take a moment and search your memory and maybe then this story of Jesus cleansing the temple will resonate with you or hit a little bit closer to home. Or turn on the TV and listen to the news or look at Facebook or Twitter and see what's going on. It seems that we live in a time right now when this is happening all around us. You've seen it. The women are speaking up. Somehow the, the incident with Harvey Weinstein, some behind the scenes producer in Hollywood, and what happened with him, and when one person had had enough, a flood came forth of women speaking up about harassment and abuse that had gone on for too long, been accepted in the good old boy network, and the this is just business the way that it's always been done. And the hashtag Me Too movement gained ground and is still rolling. And after the school shooting at Parkland, the children, the youth, the teenagers, not even old enough yet to vote, but they're speaking up and they're marching and they're showing up in the halls of legislatures and they're saying enough. We've seen our friends and our teachers massacred again. And we may not have the answers, but enough's enough. And so they give a dramatic answer and action. And again, there are the people who don't like that they're not keeping their place. But again and again, people are saying enough is enough. Something has to change. We seem to have reached a tipping point in our society when many different groups are no longer willing to stand by and let business as usual go on. Instead, it seems that there are more and more people tipping the scales toward justice. Just as Jesus is tipping over the tables of the money changers in the temple today. Enough is enough. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. When Jesus entered the temple that day, he found more than just the corruption of the commercialization of religion. What probably upset him most was that he found a faith that had become stale. It had become in so many ways downright dirty. People were taking advantage of others and ritual had become more important than the condition of the heart of the worshipers. What Jesus did, I believed, was to challenge a religious leadership and a status quo that had become smug in their authority. They knew where wisdom resided. It resided with them. They were the keepers and the teachers of the law. 
They were the judges and the scribes. It was a hypocritical religious system that had become far too comfortable with how things were and far too convinced that they owned all the truth and had a control over it and had a right to have control over it. But it was a system that desperately needed to change. And so here comes Jesus, like a wrecking ball. And things are going to tumble and things are going to get turned over. Because the faith community at that time was so wrapped up in rules and ritual and rightness according to the law that a fresh revelation of God, a sincere experience of connection to God and God's heart just couldn't even seem to get through. It was impossible for them to see because they were blinded by the obstacles that hindered their ability. Obstacles placed there by people who said, this is the way it shall be, ever has been done, and you better not mess with it. We will tell you who's in and who's out. We will tell you what you can and cannot do, what you must and must not believe. Obstacles. So as was written in the story of Elijah and Samuel, that very damning sentence that said, and the word of God was rare in those days. That's what Jesus walked in on. Someone swinging a sledgehammer, going to tear down the walls that were keeping the people from an honest and sincere experience of God. You know, there's no way to make improvements in an old house without making a mess. Right? There's no clean and tidy way to go about reconstruction. There's going to be plaster dust and dirt and nails and smelly carpet has to be ripped out. Some things have to be cast aside and other things just need a really good cleaning. That's what Lent is all about, right? We have this season and it is a tradition. It's not in the Bible. It's based on Bible, but it's not in the Bible. It's not law. It is a tradition. But this one's a good tradition, meant to keep us from getting stale, meant to tell us that every year you need to stop and slow down and get away from the business of the church's marketplace and go on a desert journey. Clean out your heart, clean out your spiritual lives and return to God with all your heart asking God to create in you a clean heart it's hard work all that bit about prayers and fasting and giving more of yourself than you're comfortable with it's hard work but that's exactly what Jesus was about when he came to the temple that day. You see, the temple cult had become so much stuff built up around God's house that they needed a good house cleaning. And so Jesus took it upon himself to do just that. And he did it with zeal for the Lord's house and determination. And he did it with a bit of good old human frustration and anger. Yes, he did. Because he was human as we are. Now this was Passover time. That's why all of this was such a hubbub. It's estimated that the population of Jerusalem would swell from about 50,000 average population at that time to nearly 200,000 at Passover. Because pilgrims would come from as far away as Persia and Syria, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. And that was a lot of hungry mouths to feed. And so the grocers and the butchers and the produce sellers were out. And a lot of weary travelers to put up for the night. And so the innkeepers and even people who rented out rooms in their homes were making money. Plus they're coming to the temple to make a sacrifice and so they have to purchase an unblemished animal and they have to change the money from wherever they're coming from into the money of the town and then into the money of the temple because the temple had its own coins and you couldn't buy a sacrifice unless you had the right kind of money with the right picture on it and it was just one big commercial mess. And it took up the people's attention and it took their resources. 
The commercial implications of Passover were enormous. And I'm pretty sure that all the merchants were making a killing off that week of Passover. But they weren't doing anything really wrong. It was all legal, you see. It was even in the laws that it was necessary that you had to first buy the Roman currency, and then you had to use the Roman currency to buy the temple currency. And it was all laid out in the law, so they were absolutely right in what they were doing. It was legal. Now, in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we hear that Jesus accuses the merchants of cheating the people and saying that they were charging exorbitant exchange rates. You know, that's capitalism, whatever the market will allow. You get as much as you can, as much as the people will pay. But it amounted to cheating people, even though it was technically legal. And then Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. So while what they were doing was technically legal, it was far from right or righteous. But even that was not what was making Jesus really angry, at least not in John's interpretation. As far as John is concerned, Jesus is upset because all this buying and selling has twisted the meaning of temple and of church and of worship. All this selling has intruded on the sacred space meant for worship, spoiling and dirtying a place that's meant to be holy. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. Which seems to indicate that Jesus was upset about the fact that the house of God had become something more like a place of business than a place of true and sincere worship. The commercialization of the sacred space was taking over and an encounter with the Holy One was becoming a commodity that would be bought and sold like a ticket to a Broadway show. Does any of that sound familiar? Fireworks for the God and Country show. Send me your money and I'll send you this blessed rag with the sweat from my brow as a prophet of God. Or send your money and I'll send you this picture and you pray these five things and God will bless you with abundance. Commodity being bought and sold in the house of God. And then Jesus goes on to say this thing which doesn't seem to connect at all. You know, they, the leaders are saying, Jesus, what right do you have to come in here and act like this? Everything we're doing is legal. It's traditional. It's written in the law. Why are you doing this? And instead of explaining himself, what Jesus says is, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. What? There he is, standing in the middle of a literal brick-and-mortar temple at the time he says this. And so it seems obvious that Jesus was talking about the building. At least it seemed obvious to them, the disciples and the Pharisees and the temple leaders. And everyone who heard him responded the same way. What, what are you talking about? It has taken us 46 years to get this temple built to this point, and it's not even done yet. We still have work to do on this temple, and you're telling us that you're going to tear it down and raise it all back up in three days? You're crazy. You're a crazy man. But Jesus doesn't reply to this. And the disciples, the disciples, don't get it until after the resurrection. And they look back and they realize that what Jesus was talking about was himself as the temple of the living God. He was trying to tell them, you have the wrong focus. They were obsessed with brick and mortar. Their mention of how long it had taken them to build the temple was a sign that they had lost their way. They no longer had the radical faith of an outrageous belief that the living God actually dwelled among God's people. To many, the religious people of Jesus' day had forgotten all the mighty acts of God in salvation when God brought them out of bondage and into freedom. So Jesus is trying to teach that God doesn't really dwell in anything made by human hands. God does not live in the tabernacle inside the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain, behind the blah blah blah, in the, and doesn't show up just on the high holy days. No, God is present in God's people. God tabernacles with God's people. 
Jesus is trying to teach them that they are supposed to be the bricks and stones made up of the hearts and lives of God's people. But somehow, the religious, the traditional, the church of the status quo of the day saw it that the temple was their own accomplishment. And therefore, they could do whatever they wanted because, after all, it was their church. And I wish that this, too, did not sound so familiar. But in Jesus, this incarnated divine person, this Emmanuel, God with you, God with us, Jesus is saying, no, I'm the new temple. This is the new covenant, and you don't understand it now, but you're going to catch on later. I am the new temple, and by extension, you as the church are the new temple through the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are the church, and I, that I don't mean this historic building on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. So by now you may be asking, okay, pastor, get to it. Where's the relevance? What does this have to do with us? Well, my answer would be just this. What they had forgotten in the doing and being of church what they had become stiff-necked and rigid about is forgetting that God's laws always, first and foremost, were given out of love so that we might know how best to live in a loving relationship first with God and then with one another. We memorize the Ten Commandments, we argue about them, we write theology about them and how they do or do not apply, especially that one about do not murder, do not kill. When is it okay to kill God? And we talk about that, but we forget that it was given out of love and so we should always approach the law from a perspective of love. You see, the trade at the temple was legal. They weren't doing anything technically wrong, but it certainly was not loving. It was greedy. It exploited the traditions of the church. And it took advantage of people. The temple traditions were all prescribed by the laws and performed according to the rules protected by the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. But the worship had become an end to itself rather than the means to love God and praise God and come into God's presence. The worship had become empty of love for God and God's love for God's people. It had become all about the law. And then along comes Jesus. And in that radical, foolish wisdom of the cross, he will suffer and die. He will lay down his life. And in John, he later says, nobody takes it from me. I give my life as a final sacrifice, so that you can be reminded that God so loves the world, that it all began in love, even there on Sinai with the giving of the law. And so in this act, the wisdom of the cross is the foolishness that counters the world. The law of the cross becomes the law of love. And I once heard a brother preacher say, if it ain't about love, it ain't about Jesus. And if it ain't about Jesus, it ain't about good news. Can I get an amen for that? If it ain't about love, it ain't about Jesus. And if it ain't about Jesus, it ain't the good news. And that's what we're here about. And Jesus Christ, a whole system of hollow religious rules and traditions is turned over like so many of those money changers temples in the courtyard. It's swept aside to make room for the new thing that the prophet Isaiah says God is always doing. Not just back then, but always as in always as in right now and in the future. Jesus Christ has turned the tables on the church of the business as usual and established a new covenant where the Beatitudes the blessed are the meek, the lowly, the hungry, the poor in spirit, the grieving. Those stand alongside the Ten Commandments to remind us that following the rules is never enough, it never has been, it never will be. And that it is only, only in following Jesus, 
who sometimes gets a bit dramatic and a bit frustrated. The Jesus who sometimes says enough is enough. It is only in following that Jesus that we will find our way. And here's the sticking point. The thing that the world thinks is absolutely foolish. In order to follow Jesus and find our way, that way always leads to the cross before it gets to the empty tomb. There's no avoiding it. But that is the way to victory in Jesus. And let the church say amen. amen. Please rise as you are able for our hymn of the day, number 277 in your red hymnal.
Repetition is good. You already heard this. Let's listen to it again. This is taken from John 2, 14. In the temple court, he found a man sitting, selling cattle, sheep, doves, and other, sitting at the table, exchanging money. So he made him whip out the cord and drove all of the temples, all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. And he scattered the coins on the floor, overturned the table to those who sold doves. He, he said, get out of here. I dare you turn my father's house into a market. How do you know it's springtime? Can anybody tell me how you know it's spring? Spring is coming. Anybody, what do you see that's, that's tell you? The title of the spring. Flowers? Flowers. Grass? Green grass? Peaches? Anything else? The trees? Bear leaves? Trees. What, yeah, what else? That you can tell that everything just turns so beautiful. Another sign that is, uh, is springtime is the baseball season, which I don't like baseball season, but it begins. And another sign that it is springtime is that people have to start doing what at their house. You know what they have to do? No. No, Please rise as you're able as together we confess our faith. 
in the words of the Apostles' Creed as found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Renewed in the promises of baptism, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church. Lead us faithfully in the way of the cross. Unite us as one body in Christ. Empower us with courage to speak out against injustice and greed, demonstrating with our words in the bodies the love of Jesus, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the world, for sheep, cattle, and all domesticated livestock, for wild creatures, service animals, and pets. Provide shelter, food, and safe drinking water for every living creature. Protect the earth from disaster and harm. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the nations. Teach us to honor one another as you command. Protect refugees and immigrants. Flee from their homes in search of safety and freedom. Guide lawmakers, peacekeepers, and all who work towards reconciliation and justice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those in need, for those who lack what they need for daily life, for people who, whose lives are consumed by their possessions, for those who grieve, for all who are ill, especially for Glendale Anderson, Rosa Barge, Doris Billups, Bruce Christie, Lula Cleveland, Samantha Castillo, Char Charlene Fuller, Dexter Fuller, Zerlene Fuller, Rosie Henderson, Helen Jackson, Tommy Jackson, Emma Jones, Marie Livier and her mother, Terry Smith, Mary Smith, for the life and ministry of Mount Olive Lutheran Church, for the leaders of our congregations, our Pastor Deb, and for our Bishop Eric and Liz, for volunteers and those who serve in our food pantry, for all those first responders and military who serve to protect our freedom, and all those whom we name aloud now. Tori and Rodney Brown. David Brown. For Leah, for Mandy, and for Jesse. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. We pray for this assembly, for those preparing for baptism or confirmation, and for their families, sponsors, and faith mentors, for Bible study leaders and participants, for our leaders in thanksgiving, for depth of wisdom and experience they offer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We remember with gratitude those who have done before us. Inspire us by their witness and example. Bring us with them into the joy of eternal life with you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Trusting in your covenant of mercy, O God, we lift our prayers to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another.
us pray. Merciful God, receive the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving and the offering of our lives, that following in the way of the cross, we may know the joy of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people to cleanse their hearts, to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life, and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. to ransom those still in bondage to prejudice and sin. The night in which he was betrayed, my Lord Jesus took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks and he gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup he gave thanks and he gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. 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 Send your Holy Spirit an advocate to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. <coughs> Come, Spirit of freedom, and let the church say amen. Amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, return to God with all your heart. Receive bread for the journey, and drink for the desert. <coughs>
wise as you are, Abel. Now may these precious gifts of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us, keep us, and unite us in His grace, now and forever. Amen. Amen. coming up uh, that we are invited to. The first one, and there should be, are there still some uh, pamphlets back there for this, Joe? There should be. The Role of the Church in Undoing Racism, a workshop that's being offered next weekend from Friday evening at 4 o'clock until 9 and then all day Saturday. This is uh, being uh, sponsored by our own uh, NTNL Synod, and uh, we have some wonderful speakers lined up. And it's really about how do we have these difficult conversations around uh, the fact that racism, systemic and institutional, is still a part of our experience, even in the church. So uh, if you're interested in that, but you cannot afford the $50, there are scholarships available, but I need to know this week. I need to know by Wednesday. So please contact me. The other event is a, yes. Uh, no, they need to know ahead of time. There has to be registration. It's limited to 40 people. Um, uh, if you can register ahead of time, you can pay at the door, but they need a count. They have to have the registration ahead of time. The other thing is, uh, Joe, could you hold up one of those flyers for the Interfaith Seder? As you know, our own Holy Communion, our Holy Meal, in which we remember God's saving acts, is closely related to the Jewish Passover meal. And a Seder is the particular uh, liturgy and celebration that the Jewish people use every year to remember God's mighty acts of salvation in their midst. So they are hosting, the uh, communities, uh, Jewish community of Dallas is hosting this annual event and it's, uh, this year it is, uh, the theme is justice and in memory of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And it should be really interesting. The mass choir from the Potter's House is going to be there. Uh, so that should be just absolutely fabulous. Uh, it is interfaith. So in other words, the Christians and the Jews and uh, folks who are Muslim gather to share what is uh, this wonderful tradition in the Jewish faith. I will be going. Uh, and so if you need a ride, just let me know. Uh, the cost is $20. But if you can't afford it, let me know. We'll see that it's covered. 
uh, the, the woman who is uh, from Congregation uh, Sheriff Israel said, we won't turn anybody away, uh, but we do need an RSVP by this week as well. Um, uh, and you can, there are flyers in the back for that. Helen. Uh, it's going to be held at Congregation Sheriff Israel, I think, which is in uh, downtown. What's the address there, Joe? Douglas Avenue, so it's like right a little ways north of, of uh, downtown. So it's not far. Drake. Choir rehearsal immediately after worship. Choir rehearsal immediately after worship. Anything else today for the good of the order? Then please rise and prepare to receive the benediction. Now may God who has called us forth from the dust of the earth, claimed us as children of light, strengthen us on our journey into life renewed. And may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon us with favor and grant us peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And our closing hymn is Just a Closer Walk with Thee, number 156 in our red hymnal.
William, hopefully your favorite videographer from 2X Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it, even when you call.